themes that people talk about, you know, uh, the supernatural more as they celebrate Halloween and people like to dress up like witches and vampires and all kinds of creepy things. And, and I'm, I'm not a huge fan of witches and vampires and creepy things. However, I want to talk about some of these things. <laughs> we know that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, that the Bible tells us that God is light. Okay. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there's no darkness in him. And we live in a real world where there's real light and there's real darkness. Okay? And we humans are threefold beings. I talk about this quite often because people tend to forget about this. You are a spirit. That's the part of you that got made alive when you got born again and gave your life to Christ. You became alive, your spirit, okay? You have your mind, your will, your emotions. We call it the soulish realm. It's kind of the bridge between your spirit and your body, for lack of a better way of putting it. And you live in an earth suit, and, and that's your flesh that everybody sees. And all of us are gonna go to the next life one day because this earth suit wasn't designed to live forever. In fact, in Christianity, we get a new earth suit. Now, if, like me, once you get past a certain age, you find that the earth suit doesn't do the things it used to do. <laughs> and it doesn't recover quite as quick as it used to, so, you know, one day I'm going to get a new earth suit. <laughs> Looking forward to that. But see, the spiritual realm is probably more real than even the natural realm, because the natural realm is only temporary. The spiritual realm is eternal. And we know that if God is light and in him there is no darkness, we also know that Lucifer, who we also know as Satan, the devil, he comes oftentimes as an angel of light. He disguises himself. He comes as one who thinks he's going to be light and give you the information and the truth. But often, actually 100% of the time, he's going to deceive you and lead you into a lie. And what happens is we have to know the difference. We have to be able to discern the difference between truth and lie. Deception or illusion. You know, we have to know the difference between things that are truth or things that are deception. Lies that appear real. This is something that all of us face on a daily basis. In the book of John, chapter 8, I think it's verse 32, it says, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We have every advantage in Christianity because God has given us his word, the Bible, and in the word of God, he's given us truth. He's revealed truth to us so we can know what truth is. And if you know truth, you don't have to believe a, a lie. Or you won't fall for a lie. You know, one of the things that, um, outside of the Bible, the one thing that I wanted to communicate to my children was Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Because it talks about the epic battle between good and evil. And the protagonist in The Lord of the Rings is this Meyer named Sauron. But there comes a point in, earlier in the story where he disguises himself as the giver of gifts. And he takes a fair form and he goes and he deceives all these people, including Celebrimbor, who forged most of the rings that the whole story revolves around, right? But he came in a form that was not true to himself to deceive. And I think Tolkien did a good job of explaining how our enemy, Satan, works in the real world. He comes in a form that looks fair, but his mission is to deceive you and get you off course. So when we're having a conversation today, I think the key word is guidance, information, established truth. 
Many people in our culture, even Christians, appeal to supernatural forces that are not aligned with God. They're not aligned with God's kingdom. And when you, as a Christian, are appealing to some other supernatural force between God and things that are aligned with his kingdom, you're appealing to Satan. Well, I'm just appealing to myself. I'm appealing to nature. You're appealing to Satan. If you're not looking to God for your source of guidance and you're not appealing to him for the help and the relief and the strength that we need, you're appealing to another source. And when you're dealing with the supernatural realm, we have to have an understanding. There's good, light, and there's evil, darkness, period. You either appeal to God and light or you appeal to darkness and evil. There's no middle ground there. As much as people like to try to create a middle ground, there is no middle ground. In this case, black and white do not make gray areas. It's very dangerous for people to appeal to the supernatural outside of God because the unobservable spiritual realm that we live in is not subject to the natural laws of this world. And there are powerful forces on both sides. It's just we know that Jesus won. So we have more power on our side. That's why the Bible tells us greater is he that is in who? Than he that is in the... So we know that we have the greater power. The, the emphasis is on the power of God that resides within Christians. So let's look at this. Start with magic. The art or practice of using charms, spells, or rituals to attempt to produce supernatural effects or control events in nature. As far as the creator God is concerned, the one that we worship, you know, Father, Son, Spirit, Jesus, there is no difference between white magic and black magic as far as God's concerned. Because it has to do with who you're calling on for help, guidance, relief, deliverance, freedom. And what people don't understand is when you call on an inferior power for help, you're going to offend the creator who made you and has the greater power. We call that sin. So for Christians to invoke a spirit that is not the spirit of God, you're in error. For worldly people that worship the earth instead of the creator who made the earth, it creates error. But I do want to qualify something right here with magic because a lot of things get rolled into magic um, that aren't involved in invoking supernatural power. For instance, um, sleight of hand or illusion, like the magicians that do all the little tricks with the cards, and it's, that's illusion, sleight of hand. That's not really magic. That's subject to natural law because the hand is quicker than the eye. Okay, so that's not the magic that I'm talking about. That's not the magic that the Bible condemns. It's, it's, it's subject to natural law, okay? And then, um, I'm just going by definition. It's based on natural law. It's not based on supernatural where you're invoking supernatural forces to do that. And I know sometimes people take that and they make it very dark, okay? And I'm not agreeing with necessarily making it very dark. I'm suggesting to you that that's not the magic that we're talking about. Sorcery. It's actually condemned in the Bible many, many times. The use of supernatural power over others through the assistance of spirits, often referred to as witchcraft. So when you're exerting your willpower over other people in conjunction with a supernatural force, a demonic spirit, you're operating in sorcery or witchcraft. Do you think that that's operating in tune with the nature of Christ? No. But people who do this, they try to justify it. How about the occult of relating to or dealing with the supernatural or magical influences, agencies, or occurrences? So these practices have to do with, again, supernatural beings, the spirit realm. 
And I believe, foundationally, God has placed a desire for the supernatural inside of all of us. But that's supposed to drive us to seek Him. And people that reject Him, they're going to seek something, but they're not going to find what they're looking for. And too many people are seeking the supernatural, but they're not seeking it with the confines that God set up where we seek Him first. And they start seeking other sources of supernatural wisdom, and they end up deceived. They end up in bondage. They end up enslaved. How we doing? This one will be fun. Astrology. It's different than astronomy. Astronomy is the study of, like, the heavenly bodies, the stars and planets. Astrology is the study that assumes and attempts to interpret the influence of heavenly bodies on human affairs. Linked very closely to astrology is horoscopes. The prediction of a person's future future based on a comparison of the zodiacal data for the time of birth with the data from a period under consideration. Now, I had to laugh when I was looking into this one. Because personally, I tell people all the time, I'd rather look to the one who breathed the stars into existence for wisdom than listen to mere humans who look at the sky and try to figure out what it means. (laughs) Okay, but I want to take it a step further. Because NASA put out an article not too long ago, a few years back. And what you guys have to understand about the zodiac and, and astrology, the, the Babylonians were the ones that kind of did this about 3,000 years ago. So even before the time of Christ, they were looking to the constellations in the skies and they developed the zodiac. But what most people don't know is there was actually 13 signs, not 12. And they had to omit one because they had a 12-month calendar at that time. The other thing that they didn't realize at that time when they created this is the Earth's axis has a little bit of a wobble and it doesn't always point the same at the same constellations. So technically, according to astrology, the zodiac that most people follow is wrong now because the Earth doesn't even point to the same constellations at the same time that the zodiac says that it does. I'm not even lying. It's, it's science. <laughs> and to make it even better, one of them, I think it points to for 45 days and another one for seven days. It wasn't even equal amounts of time. But to keep it simple, they just assigned it to months. But now, we're so far removed from what they created 3,000 years ago, it's messed up. People think they're born under one sign, and really they're born under another, but at the end of the day, who cares? But so many people think the planets govern their life. I was born at this time, so I'm supposed to be like this. Really? Ay, ay, ay. Are we having fun today, white magic? Okay. Um, let's go back to, hey, let's go to the scriptures in the Old Covenant. See, these things, astrology, communicating with the dead. They call that necromancing. So someone channels a spirit of a supposedly dead person so that they can come back and commune with them and have a conversation. Now, I want to introduce you to a term that the Bible uses. It's called a familiar spirit. A familiar spirit, see, spirits are ancient beings, and they've been around a while. In fact, there could be some spirits in here. They might be hanging around, some of the people that walked in. I heard spirits like to hang out in churches, especially religious spirits. (laughs) They don't like this place too much. (laughs) You think I'm kidding, they don't like this place. We're not very religious. (laughs) We're holy, (laughs) But, but here's the thing. We like our true religion. Here's the thing. A familiar spirit impersonates someone that was. Because a spirit is around whether you see it or not sometimes, especially if it's a generational spirit. 
And people can tap into these demonic entities and they come and they can even have information that maybe nobody else would know about because that spirit's observing something even though you can't see it observing something. And then they start channeling it and they deceive people into believing that you're actually talking to the person instead of a familiar spirit that's impersonating the person. And then they kind of take that and they lead you into bondage and give you lots of wrong information in the end. Yeah. Saul tried this, so I will read about that later. Well, maybe you won't. Saul did this. He went and called up Samuel. And, 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 and God took the kingdom away from him because he consorted with a necromancer instead of consulting with the creator God. He lost his kingship. God gave the kingdom to David because Saul couldn't obey God. See, obedience is hugely important. So when we're talking about these matters, we have to understand obedience is one of the keys. All right. Old Testament, Old Covenant. Leviticus 19.31 do not defile yourselves by turning to mediums or to those who consult with spirits of the dead. I am the Lord your God. Why would we have to talk to mediums? Why would we have to talk to people that can call up dead spirits? We can talk right to the creator who knows everything. He'll give you much better information and he'll even frame it in the proper context. And oh, by the way, he has your best interest in mind. The only thing God has to gain from his relationship with you is simply that relationship. Amen. Yeah. You can't add anything else to his life except relationship. Just a thought. Deuteronomy 18, 9 to 12. <laughs> when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, be careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. And this seemed to be a problem for the nation of Israel. Because they would go in and they would either, you know, okay, everyone, listen, we're going to conquer your land. So here's your options. You can leave, you can submit to us, or you can fight us, but we're going to kill you. And some of the nations that they conquered, they would often kill the men, but leave the women and children alive. But then they started marrying the women, and then the women would lead them to worship these false gods, and then they would go into idolatry, and then God would have to judge the nation, and then they would call out to him, and then they would come back to God, and then they would, revert, they would repeat the cycle. Kind of sounds like some people I know in the church today. <laughs> we go do our own thing, we fall on our face, we crawl back to church and say, God, please forgive me. We try to build our life back up a little bit. Then we get comfortable again because we're back on our feet and God gave us a great job. So then we start working seven days and we forget about him. And then what happens? Then we fall back on our face and then we crawl back to God again. And no one in here has ever done that though. Uh... History tends to repeat itself. <laughs> okay. Be careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. And some of you go, oh my goodness, why would we do that? But we kill babies every day. Now, in a few weeks, we're going to talk about this because we understand that there's lots of grace, there's lots of mercy, and there's lots of forgiveness at the cross. Okay? But we need to understand, okay, Never sacrifice your son or daughter. Do not let people practice fortune telling or use sorcery or interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these detestable things that the Lord your God will drive them out ahead of you. So you see because they've crossed the line into the supernatural and started getting wisdom from the wrong place, God drove them out. That's what it says. Now, here's a laughable concept to me. <laughs> um, almost laughable. <laughs> because it's sad too. But Christian witches. There's people that believe in Jesus, but they practice witchcraft. They call themselves Christian witches. 
<coughs> now, for me, I, I have some theological challenges with this concept. But we have to understand, light and darkness don't ever mix. You can't combine the two into one entity. It's like bitter water, sweet water. You can't. You can't have blessing and cursing coming from the same place. I want you to understand something. Any time that you as an individual are exercising your will over someone else, you're messing with things you shouldn't be. And so many times, even in the church, people do this. Because when they don't get their way, what do they do? They manipulate, they lie, they pout, they threaten, they get depressed, they're angry, because why? because you didn't do what I wanted you to do. Essentially, they're not operating in the order of Christ. They're operating in selfish ambition. Okay? And then we're practicing witchcraft because we're trying to exercise our will over others and coerce people into coming to our way of thinking through non-healthy ways. Can I tell you a good indication of how you know if someone's operating in truth or lie. When people are trying to exercise their will over you, what you need to look at is, is love present? Amen. Because the biggest indication you're going to find that they're trying to operate in witchcraft, not in the spirit of Christ to encourage you back to truth and righteousness, is the lack of love. Christianity is rooted in love. So if people love you, they're going to encourage you to come back to the truth and to do the right thing. The rest of the time, they're not operating in love. They're not operating in Christianity. They're operating in the flesh, and they're trying to exercise their will over your life. That's witchcraft. It's quiet. It's most fully realized by the absence of love when people are operating in this. Okay, let's go to the New Covenant. Everyone said, yay, New Covenant. Yay. Woo! <laughs> so there's a few sections of this I want to pick up. Let's start with Acts 19. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried, operative word, <laughs> to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence they fled from the house naked and battered. They got beat down by the devil, okay? The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to the Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Catch this. Many who became believers, everyone say many. many. What did they do? They confessed their sinful practices a number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars, so the message of the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. A couple things here. See, they were messing with the supernatural, but they didn't know Jesus. And when you mess with the supernatural and you're not under God's authority, you're opening the door for the enemy to destroy your life. Because you're playing with things you don't know what you're playing with. There's an old idiom. Idiom? Yeah, I think that's the word I'm looking for. If you play with fire, you're going to get... Oh, you know that one. <laughs> you see, the seven sons of Sceva, 
they had some incantations and they had this formula that they thought was going to give them authority over the supernatural world. Didn't work so good for them. But see, as Christians, if you're submitted to Christ as a believer, if you're submitted to Christ, if you're in his kingdom, if you're under his authority, if you're in his will, I believe we are reflectors of Jesus' glory. In other words, I don't think I'll ever be quite as holy as he is. <laughs> I get my holiness from him. But when I'm walking in God's authority and under his jurisdiction, and I'm under the shadow of his wings, as the Bible talks about, I believe that we start to look like the one that we're serving. And when you start to look like Jesus and you start reflecting his glory and his power, I think the devil doesn't know the difference. So when you make a command to go in the name of Jesus, you're under his authority, you're representing him, and the enemy has to go. That's why true believers have no problem driving out a spirit. We don't have to be afraid of spirits. They're afraid of us. Got to get that set up right. <laughs> Oh, brother, you don't know. <laughs> so I'm teaching in the Bible school in Manila. I actually teach a lot in the Bible school. I'm teaching in the Bible school, hanging out with some of the Bible school students, a lot of pastors coming in. God told me, told me, RJ, you're going to go preach in Antigua. It's a province in, in the Philippines in the south, south of Manila anyway, south of Luzon. When I told the students, God told me I'm going to go preach in Antigua, this is the response I got. No, brother RJ, you don't want to go to Antigua. The devil lives in Antigua because they believe all evil originated there. And there's these witches down there. They call them Aswan. And, and they said, man, I went to Antigua and the devil jumped on me and I couldn't breathe for an hour and finally asked Jesus to help me and he came and rescued me. So I'm lecturing at the University of the Philippines on culture. And one of my students comes up to me after class and says, hey, can you come speak at my church? I said, sure. She says, but you don't understand my church is in a place called Antigua. I said, sign me up, Jack. God told me a year ago I was going to go preach there. <laughs> Went down to Antigua. You know what I taught on? <laughs> the authority of the believer. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I went around and encouraged the church on the authority of the believer because they had a lack of understanding of the authority that they had in Christ over the enemy. And then they took me down to minister to the witch doctor, the warlock. And once he got saved, we had a bonfire. And he got rid of some stuff. And then we were able to preach the gospel and some people got saved. See, the same power that operated in this new, new covenant is still operating through us today. But you need to understand your authority. You need to understand where God's placed you in his kingdom and you need to be fully submitted to his plan. Galatians 5.19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Interesting. You know, we like to pick on sexual immorality and impurity and lustful pleasures, which we do, because Christians shouldn't live that way. Um, then we get to idolatry, which is anything that takes the place in your heart of God, which we need to pick on. Sorcery, people overlook that one all the time. Oh, I don't want to... <laughs> Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you habitually live in this lifestyle, you're going to have a really rough conversation when you stand before the Creator. Because His Word has already told you, you're not going where you think you're going. You're not going to spend eternity where you think you're going to spend eternity. And then let's go to Revelation 21.8. Cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars. Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. 
Revelation 22, 14 and 15. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They'll be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. Isn't it interesting? All of these things are in the same conversation when you live that way habitually as a lifestyle. If you live a lifestyle of hate, you fall into that category. So then it gets to this. Rebellion is in the same conversation. It's on the same list as witchcraft. Remember Samuel, the prophet that I was telling you about? He's talking to Saul, the king, because Saul didn't obey God. The Amalekites were wicked, evil people who would ambush the women and the children at the back of the caravan and massacre them. They were vile and violent. They degraded the people that they conquered. And God rose up Israel and he told Saul, he said, wipe them out because they never repented for attacking your women and children. They weren't brave to go attack the men at the front of the line. They attacked the women at the back of the line. How many said, real nice people? Yeah. I love those guys. They like to beat up on their wives and kids, but a real man gets in their face and they're like, uh-oh. They back down real quick, don't they? Cowards. Samuel says to Saul, what's more pleasing to your Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fatter rams. God wants you to obey him first. He's not interested in what you sacrifice for him. Because Samuel was like, hey, look, Jesus, look, God. I just got all this plunder that we're going to sacrifice to you. And God's like, yeah, it would have been better if you just killed the guy like I said to. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Because you rejected the command of the Lord, he rejected you as king. You need to understand something. When you as an individual rebel against God's word, you're operating in rebellion and you're operating in witchcraft. If you're not submitting to God's voice, you're submitting to a counterfeit voice. You're believing a lie, you're in deception, and you're not in truth. If you're not in truth, I assure you, the light is not in you. And then we get to Hebrews 6. This is an awesome verse. Challenging, but awesome. Hebrews 6, 4 to 6. It is impossible to bring back to repentance those who were once enlightened, those who have experienced the good things of heaven and shared in the Holy Spirit who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the power of the age to come and who then turn away from God. It is impossible to bring such people back to repentance by rejecting the son of God. They themselves are nailing him to the cross once again and holding him up to public shame. It's a challenging portion of scripture because some people think, uh-oh, did I mess up for good? Did I commit the unpardonable sin? There's a man named David Wilkerson. He was a prophet in the, in the 80s and the 90s into the year 2000 pastoring a church over in New York. If you, if you remember the movie, The Cross on the Switchblade, that's David Wilkerson, okay? And he's talking here about how when you're in rebellion to God's word, repentance has no effect. So let's pretend for a minute. I could, I could leave my wife and go live with a mistress. She's over here, so I'm gonna go over here. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that, 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 <laughs> that, that might result in homicide. <laughs> and I probably taught her too good so she wouldn't get caught. <laughs> I was joking with my wife earlier. I said, what happens when you take a Sicilian and a Lebanese and you put them together in marriage? You get two fish because we both sleep with one eye open. <laughs> I'm just having fun. All you religious spirits can calm down. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Let's pretend someone else leaves their wife and goes to live with their mistress. 
I like this story better already. <laughs> While they are actively in that relationship, they can repent every day. But because they're in rebellion to God's word, repentance has no effect in their life. Because if they're truly repentant or penitent, they will leave the ungodly relationship and make things right. And then repentance will fulfill its work inside of their life. Does that make sense? And, and, and see, this is the thing, because there's lots of people that practice all kinds of sins, but while they're actively in their sin, they're feeling guilty, so they're trying to repent of their sin, but they're not really willing to get out of their sin. And that's what this is talking about. It's not going to accomplish what you want it to when you repent because you're not really repenting because you're not changing your lifestyle. See, repentance without lifestyle change is simply lip service. It's empty words. Leaves you in a bad place with God. All right, I want to go to Acts chapter 8. Read one more. I think I got time for this. In Acts 8, 9, a man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. I want you to note this. He claimed to be someone great because he was a sorcerer. It tells me something about his motive. This guy, Simon the sorcerer, he liked the attention, he liked the glory. Everyone say he liked the glory. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. Man, that's, that's quite a title. <laughs> they listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believed Philip's message of the good news concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went, and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles that Philip performed. Because we know that the true power of God is always greater than the counterfeit. Don't you remember when Moses went before Pharaoh's court and Pharaoh called out his sorcerers and they tried to imitate Pharaoh, uh, Moses when he threw a stick down and it turned into a snake? And they were like, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Incantation, threw their staff down, it turned into a snake. Interesting, Moses' rod ate their snake. <laughs> signifying the power of his God was greater, right? But when Simon saw the Spirit was given, when the apostles laid hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he exclaimed, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit's a free gift that God gives to people. But see, Simon, while he gave his life to Christ, his motive never changed for self-glorification and self-deification. He came into Christianity, but he never laid down his selfish ambition. So his motive was off, and this created a huge problem for him. So Peter looks at him and says, may your money be destroyed with you for thinking God's gift can be bought. You can have no part in this for your heart's not right with God. Repent of your wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he'll forgive you of evil thoughts, for I can see that you're full of bitter jealousy and held captive by sin. There's many people who do good things in God's name. Listen carefully. They do it in God's power, but there's this glory issue. At the end of the day, they want the recognition for what God has done through them. Instead of giving the glory to the creator, they want the glory for themselves and their motive is off, and it will never work out as they intended it to. God's gift plus a servant's heart equals building the kingdom. God's gift plus a jealous heart. What do you mean a jealous heart? The bitter jealousy that Peter's talking about, he envied and was jealous of the gift that the apostles had to lay hands on people to give them the Holy Spirit. He was envious of that power, and it created a bitterness inside of him against them. Bitter people are always going to be defiled. Bitter people will always begin to start bad-mouthing the true men and women of God. Always. It 
they can't help but start doing that. They address it later in the epistles. He starts talking about this guy. Yeah, yeah, he, he got bitter and he's got nothing good to say. And this guy got bitter and he got nothing good to say. Often what happens is in situations where there is correction, people don't want to receive. And when you know more than the person in a position to correct you, You've put yourself in arrogance and pride and you're operating in the kingdom of Satan and you're rebelling against God's word 100% of the time. And then what happens is instead of receiving correction and making the adjustments, they get into bitterness and they become jealous of the gift so they want to try to tear it down. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. I'm so amazed, man. I want to be like Jesus, but when I tell people I'm humble and gentle at heart, they look at me and tell me I'm in pride. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy to bear, and my, the burden I give you is light. See, Jesus came to earth to bring freedom to people. It's not a heavy yoke to live the Christian life. The heavy yoke comes on when religious people try to impose their will upon you. Christ came for freedom, freedom from sin. There's a yoke, there's a price to pay, when you want to justify your sin and stay in it. That's a heavy burden. And see, there's two sides to that coin because religion tries to condemn people into feeling like they're not good enough to control them. Religion outside of true religion, <laughs> taking care of the widows and the orphans, right? Operating in the love of Christ. But see, what happens is, on the other side of that, we justify our wrong behavior and you're not willing to lay your burden down, so you're gonna stay in bondage. And on both extremes, there's, there's error. And this is where we as the body of Christ have to come together and lay our sin down that so easily besets us at the foot of the cross so that we can take on the righteousness of God and start operating in his kingdom. And then we start building his kingdom. We start operating in the kingdom of God. We start operating in the power of God. There's lots of people, oh, Christianity doesn't work for me. Well, <laughs> Christianity always works because God's principles are always true as I've been talking about the last few weeks. So God's not the one that's not aligned. But you might want to look at your heart and see if there's any selfish ambition in there. Make sure there's not some pride in there. Make sure you're not trying to control others because if you're operating in witchcraft, you're operating in rebellion to God and his word. Or maybe you're just rebelling against God's word because you don't believe it. What did you say a couple weeks ago? Rick Warren, you only believe the parts of the Bible that you obey. Stand up with me. Yeah, what a fun lesson on white magic today. I believe that God speaks to people's hearts all the time. I believe he's talking to you all the time. Most of the time, you're not listening, but we need to get in listening mode. And I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit right now for a moment, because if he's talking to your heart, and he's telling you that maybe you need to repent of your sin and give you your life to him. Because see, true repentance is when we say, God, I surrender my life to you. I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you. I want to follow your commands. I want to obey your teachings. In that moment, repentance, we change our life and he gives us a new heart and he gives us the ability to live life from within. And we can receive forgiveness of sin. And whether it's a sin you committed or a sin someone else said you committed or a sin you think you committed, it doesn't matter. You receive forgiveness. 
Because at the foot of the cross, we all become equal. Sinners saved by grace because of the blood of Jesus. So we always do a call to repentance where we give people an opportunity to repent of their sin and give their life to Christ. Connected to that is after you surrender your life to Christ, you need to make a clean break from the world system that you lived in. And you do this by being baptized in water. And what you do when you go into the waters of baptism is you're stating publicly, I'm gonna live the Christian life. And symbolically, you're taking the old life and you're leaving it in the water and you come up to a fresh start with Jesus, free from the guilt and the shame and the condemnation of your past. One of the writers in Peter even talks about how your conscience gets cleansed in the water. So if that's you, you need to repent of your sin or maybe you need to get baptized in water today, I want you to just be brave and be bold and come down out of your chair and come down and see me here at the front. I think my friends Greg and Lisa are here and they've got a tank full of water in the back to baptize you, but they'll pray with you for salvation. They'll pray with you so you can give your life to Christ. Come on down. You guys are all welcome. Come on down, sir. Is there anyone else that God's talking to your heart this morning? Come on down. Come on over. Come on down. God's brought you guys to this place. Is there anyone else God's speaking to you today? Okay. We bless you guys. We bless you. When we come to the table, the Lord's Supper today, you know, we have the bread that represents his broken body. It was broken for you. But I perceive that there's probably quite a few of you in here that somewhere along the line you fell off the rails and you've been trying to control others. You've been exercising witchcraft over them. You've been dabbling with supernatural outside of the power of God. And as I was talking today, the lights went on. And if you would like to come down and join us at the front, I want to encourage you to do so and draw a clean line in the sand and say, God, you're going to have to help me with my words and with my will. I want to repent of that and lay that down. Or maybe if you've been dabbling with some stuff that you need to get free from, you need to come down because there's a clear point of contact at the altar where something's going to die today. And we always want to lay down the flesh. We want to lay down the, the sin. We want to lay down the agreement that we have with the enemy. So you guys can come down to the front. It's okay. I'm going to pray. Father, I thank you that as your body was broken, by faith, you snap the power of hell off of the lives of individuals all over this room right now. And I thank you, Father, that it was for freedom that Jesus came. I thank you, Father, that your yoke is easy and your burden is is light. Today, Father, we surrender all sorcery, witchcraft. We surrender hatred. We surrender rebellion to you. And we ask you to help us. If we're going to invoke the supernatural, we're going to invoke the power of God in our lives. And we ask you, Jesus, to come now and liberate us, mind, body, and spirit, in Jesus' name. And then he took the cup. the blood of the new covenant. And the Bible says that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. No weapon. And Father, as we have the cup in our hand at the table, we release forgiveness and we receive forgiveness. We set aside every grudge. We uproot the bitterness in our lives and the jealousy and the envying and the strife. And we receive forgiveness now. As we've released others, Father, I thank you that you release us. And Father, we know that the blood of Jesus is powerful. And we know that we have authority over our enemy. So I thank you 
that because of the blood, we can align ourselves with your purposes for our life. And this day, God, you bring freedom. This day, we have the victory. And this day, the shackles of hell are broken off of our lives. And we are free, mind, body, and spirit, because of the blood of Jesus. So like a flood now, Father, let your presence and power come into the lives of each person here as we partake.